Well, welcome everyone to this seminar, this little conference, call it what you like, on togetherness. To be together with each other, in conjunction with each other, jointly, in collaboration, in partnership, in league, side by side, hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder, hand in glove, being together. The idea of unity, solidarity and cooperation. Together for each of us will have different meanings. Maria, my wife and I have been together for 46 years. Our two daughters have been with us for 44 and 41 years. And our four grandchildren, 11 years and to three years. So the importance of the notion of togetherness. And last Wednesday, Togetherness took on a special meaning in my mother's family because the last of my parents' generation passed away at the age of 90. She was a bit younger than my mother uh, and she had married my mother's first cousin who grew up on farms next to each other. So a special togetherness. And so today I want to welcome you all here and to, uh, we will um, firstly, before we have a panel discussion with input, I'm going to ask Uncle Reverend Ray Minikin to please acknowledge country. This is not my country, so I am from the Cubby Cubby people in southeast Queensland on my father's side, and Gurang Gurang on my mother's side, which is north of Bundaberg in Queensland. And I also have deep connections, cultural connections, to the people from Ambram Island in uh, the South Pacific, in Vanuatu. And uh, my grandfather was taken at the age of 12 and brought into Australia, along with 60,000 other South Sea Islander people. Uh, they call it blackbirding, we call it slavery. <laughs> and so it's at nonce for me to acknowledge today uh, this land here that we're on. And uh, we just want to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and in particular the Wongol people of the Eora Nation, as the first and traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today. And we acknowledge our gratitude that we share this land today, our sorrow for the cost of that sharing, and our hope that we can move towards a place of justice and partnership together. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. We're now going to have a um, panel discussion uh, with the five speakers who are going to be given seven minutes to speak. At six minutes, they're going to get a gong <laughs> to keep them. Okay, a song? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tin and I'm a musician and composer and I was asked to write a special song for this occasion this afternoon and so I would like to sing it for you and it's called Shine in the Light of Love. Let me off. 
offer my hand to you, let me give to you a smile, let me speak a kind word and sit with you a while. Though the world says we are different, underneath it isn't true, for I see you as my brother, and I'm your brother too. In the light of peace, may you shine, shine together for a while, for a world that's in our hands, may Let me hear each word you say. Let me see the world through your eyes and praise the good in each day. Though the world says we are different, underneath this isn't true. For I see you as my sister. This is my blessing just for you. In the light of love, in the light of peace, may you shine, shine together for a while, for a world that's in our hands, may you shine. Shine your light into the darkness. May you shine, shine, shine in the light of love, in the light of peace. May you shine, shine together for a while, for a world is in your hands, and may you shine. Thank you, Tim, and for giving us the blessing of shine together for a while, for the world is in God's hands. Thank you. I want to begin with my little contribution to the um, panel discussion. And Back in 9-11, 40 days after 9-11, I, as the head of Religions for Peace Asia, together with the heads of the 95 other national chapters of Religions for Peace right across the world, were called together in an act of togetherness to the UN Plaza in New York. And we were there to give particular support to the Muslim leaders across the world who are under pressure because of what had happened at 9-11. And so we all flew there. When we went, Qantas was still going to New York 
from Los Angeles to New York, there were nine, uh, four passengers. And when you arrived at the US airports, there were these National Guardsmen armed to the teeth. So we had our conference. We were um, given talks by very senior UN officials, other academics, religious leaders, and so on. To end it all off, we were taken to ground zero late at night and this there was this incredible noise coming from ground zero where they had the tr big huge trucks were carrying the debris to put on a um a barge to go down to an isolated island we went into the ch a church catholic church that was right on the edge a Greek Orthodox church had been destroyed when the Twin Towers fell down. And it was an interfaith service led by the New York Philharmonic Choir. Beautiful. Then right at the end, the parish priest stepped forward and he told us this story. Several days after 9-11, this man came into the church and walked up to the priest and said, Father, I've come to say sorry. It turned out that he was a Jewish doctor. And the church had been used as a medical staging post not very many people were injured it was by the falling debris this 3000 people of course had been killed and when we got there the new yorkers were just starting to come out of their apartments and buildings and it was clear they were suffering from survivor syndrome because so many of their friends relatives had been killed while they had survived. Anyway, this church was used um, as a medical staging post. And this man turned out to be a Jewish doctor who was passing by. And as they brought the injured people into the church, he looked around the church looking for bandages. And he saw the altar cloths, and so he started to tear them up to bind the wounds of those who had been injured. And he knew that the altar cloths are sacred to Christians, and so he, as a Jew, had come back to say sorry. So it was a beautiful story. I'm now going to ask Uncle Ray, Reverend Ray Minikin, to share his stories with us. He's an Aboriginal pastor, as he said, um, with uh, relatives from Queensland and also South Sea Islanders. He's uh, received the Hubert Walter Award for Reconciliation and Interfaith Cooperation. And I think he also has something to do with the Scarred Trees Ministry. And that caught my eye because in, my, in one of the campuses in my university, RMIT University in Melbourne, um, we have about six or seven scarred trees. So... So welcome, Ray. Over to you. Shall I sit? Yes. I stand. Okay, sit. Well, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be with you here this afternoon on this beautiful uh, August afternoon, beautiful sunshine out there on Wangal country. And as I, as I explained where I'm from, 
Um, my topic I want to talk about isn't peace building as much as trust building. I was in New York last year, not in New York, uh, um, in uh, Switzerland there. Uh, what's that big country? Uh, what's that big, big, big city there that all the, all the UN go to? Geneva. I was in Geneva. I went there with, uh, I was representing my people and we had people from um, uh, New Zealand as well as from Canada, Indigenous peoples. We went to lobby our three separate uh, entities or ambassadors about international trade for Indigenous peoples because we were saying that here in Australia, for example, all the resources that have been taken out of our country and being sold on the international market belong to us, but we don't get any benefit from it. And so we're wondering how we could get some kind of benefits from the international trade and how our intellectual property could be protected, as well as other things that we wanted to uh, share with the international community there on the ways in which our Indigenous peoples were treated with international trade. And uh, <clears throat> one of the ambassadors, beautiful lady, the Canadian ambassador, uh, her name is Nadia Theodore, and she has a heritage from the Caribbean, so she was as black as I was, and so we connected straight away, and I got a moment to call her aside as the ambassador for Canada to the World Trade Organization, and I simply asked her one of the most important questions, for me anyways at that time, was, uh, <clears throat> sis, what do you think is the most important issue facing humankind today? And in a wink, in a, in a blink of an eye, she said, Ray, the most important thing that we face as human beings today is trust. We don't trust each other. We don't trust our governments. Our governments don't trust us. <laughs> countries don't trust company, countries. We've lost trust in our institutions. And so what she was saying is if you want to build, build peace again, you've got to learn how to trust each other because it's the foundations of trust. And as an Indigenous person, I've lived under the Aboriginal Protection Acts of this, this country here. We know what it's like to be invaded. We know what it's like to be colonised. We know what it's like to be continually colonized, but we also reach out our hands in some kind of reconciliatory processes in order to try to find peace and trust. But that's a, it's, it's an elusive thing for us. We find it very difficult to find out why people don't trust us, especially in our own country. And then in that particular process, we then find it difficult to reach out our hands. And the Uluru statement from the heart was that particular gift. For us, it was a gift to the nation to say, let's make peace. Let's work together. We know what this country can provide and what it is and who is in it and where all the treasures are and how we can fix it also because of the climate crisis. But our hand was rejected again. And so once again, for us, how can you build peace when you're continually, continuously pushed aside and saying, no, we will not give you a voice. You're not old enough. You're not good enough. Or whatever other excuses that they can come up with. That uh, we don't have that kind of voice in this country, in our own country. <laughs> And so we find it frustrating to talk about these issues without a clear understanding of, of why, where we're going as a nation if you can't put your trust or your faith in the first peoples of this country and you keep on rejecting and resisting our attempts at reconciliatory processes. It makes it difficult. And so I come back to this thing that our sister in Canada said to us at that time there, at the World Trade Organization in Geneva. She said the missing link, the thing that this whole world faces at the moment 
is trust. Trust. And how then do we build trust? Trust between each of us as individuals, trust between institutions. Today, trust between religions. And so this difficulty, I find, in terms of peace building, if we don't have a good trust agenda or an understanding how we can build that trust again, it makes it difficult to find a place and a space for peace to take place. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Um, you're making a very important point. I now want to introduce Sister Maureen Goodman, who's come here from London. She's Brahma Kumari. She's program director for the Brahma Kumaris in the UK. Um, she's particularly interested in young people, women's empowerment, sustainability, and building a spiritual capacity. She's been involved in inter-religious dialogue for more than 40 years. And she's, among many other things, um, an ambassador to the Peace Pledge to Live Loving Kindness and Compassion. And she's part of the strategic circle of the Spirit of Humanity Forum. So please welcome Maureen Goodman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, Father Ray, for your um, your sharing. I think we, I hope, probably all agree that the foundation for peace building is dialogue. And dialogue is only possible when we listen to each other. And real listening is possible when, if you take the anagram of uh, listen, that you practice some inner silence. And this is a very important dimension, that peace is something that we can build from the inside out. When we were preparing for a forum, which first began in 2012, the Spirit of Humanity Forum, with the aim of bringing leaders together to explore core values in decision-making and governance, the person who was the at that time, the head of the conflict prevention program of the Swedish government said to us, there are many people in peace building who understand that peace has to come first from within, first from the heart, and then it can come into practice in reality, in the world and in society. And they don't have a place where they can talk about this. And we have to create a safe space in this forum where those who are working in peace building can come together and can share this perspective that it's not just about the external, but it's about touching the heart. And so the Spirit of Humanity Forum was born and has been working with leaders since then. And when people come there, we don't want them to talk about what they do, but what truly motivates them from within. And many others are inspired through that. And they're inspired to bring a spiritual dimension, or let's say a humanitarian dimension to the work that they do. Last July, so just very recently, we brought together religious leaders at our retreat center just outside Oxford in UK. We actually worked with somebody many of you know, Bishop Philip Huggins, very good friend. And our theme was inner peace, outer peace, 
exploring the deep connection between the two. And we had quite high level leaders, someone from the Vatican, an archbishop, Grand Mufti and rabbis and so on, about 30 of us. And we wanted them to come together to feel spiritually nurtured. And it was very beautiful that in talking about the deep connection, we didn't just talk. In fact, we spent time in silence together. And the dialogue that comes out of silence is very profound. And all of them said that, well, we're leaving with this deeper commitment to nurture our own inner spirituality, of course, within our faith tradition, because this is the way we can build peace. And I remember one particular quote, that the mind can justify evil, but the heart cannot. And if you're able to reach the heart, then is violence possible? And someone else saying that the practice of inner silence is what can spread peace to those around me and give and create an atmosphere of peace that can influence our world, but we don't practice enough our inner silence. So there were many profound moments as people dialogued together, walked in silence together, lived together as people from many different traditions. And just finally, I want to mention an opportunity to travel to Ukraine a couple of months into the war in April 22 with a group of religious leaders. This was with the Elijah Interfaith Institute that is actually based in Jerusalem. And so you can imagine right now how things are. Well, we can only imagine, can't we? And now, of course, everything online, but they're doing every two weeks, bringing together Muslims, Jews, Christians, also from other faiths, to dialogue and to pray together, particularly about human dignity and what does it mean to maintain human dignity at a time of war. And we went to Ukraine not to take sides, not naively thinking, oh, we can make peace, but we went to be with the people, to bring a message of hope, a message of love, for them to know that there are those who are praying for them, meditating for them, supporting them in whatever way they can. People were very, very touched that we had taken that time to be together. And later, one of the, the archbishop who had actually, one of the people who'd hosted us in Ukraine, he came to a meeting of the Elijah Board at the Parliament of the World's Religions last year. And he said, I had no idea that religions could come, representatives of religions could come together in this way and build interreligious friendship. And so for him, it was a clearer indication of what his commitment to peace. And so peace building, a very profound work, not an easy work, not a quick work, but the foundation is this, dialogue, listening, and silence. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen, for reminding us of the importance of inner silence and the need for listening. Some Aboriginal spiritualities have a word called dadiri, which is usually translated by deep listening. 
the necessity of that. So thank you, Maureen. Our next speaker is Rabbi Zalman Castell, who is the National Director of Together for Humanity. He's a Hasidic Jewish rabbi here in Sydney at St. Ives, is it? Or... Yep, got it. Okay. Um, and he also teaches Bible study at the Shabbat House on the North Shore. He has a graduate diploma in education and also is a member of the Order of Australia for in recognition of his work um, in interfaith and intercultural understanding. Uh, it's a privilege to be here today um, to hear um, Sister Maureen, Reverend Ray, uh, Reverend Manash, um, Zora, um, to hear about trust, inner peace, dialogue. I will share three stories. There was once a bridge builder who had a terrible enemy. The enemy was as relentless and ruthless as he was destructive and devious. The bridge builder and the enemy are both me. Two weeks ago, on a Friday, I looked at Facebook and saw that someone had accused me of being a hypocrite. I had a busy to-do list, but I deviated from my to-do list, and I responded to this accusation. And in the back of my mind, my enemy got to work to convince me that I must do better. What a sweet idea. But hidden behind those sweet words was a more destructive message. You're not good enough. And as I listened to the message of my inner enemy, my, en my energy level dropped. I felt shame. I just felt a sense of despair. It was just too hard. And I spoke to a wise woman who said, you must make friends with your enemy. And so I did. And I engaged with dialogue within myself. And I told my inner critic that I understand that he doesn't trust me. He's worried that I will fail. I might, but I'm going to try pretty hard. And I told my little inner enemy that I'm going to accept your criticism with love, but I will translate it from your harsh words into gentle ones. I want to tell you a second story about the church. There was a church on Union Street near my school. It used to have the bells. And for me, it was a symbol of hatred. I grew up with stories about how churches in Ukraine would be staging grounds for pogroms. The church would rile up the peasants and tell them how the Jews were Christ killers and they are enemies and must be destroyed. And every Easter, the Jews would hide in their homes waiting for the worst. And every Easter, the worst happened. And then I grew up and I met Christian people, Catholic people, and we had dialogue and I began to understand that the Christians in those little villages are not the Christians that I was having dialogue with. That in every community, there are all kinds of different people. And so my journey of dialogue began. And on, at a Catholic school the other day, next to a Muslim woman in a hijab, uh, named Asya, we talk to young people about dialogue. And perhaps one way to rebuild trust is to understand that there are a range of ways we can talk to each other and respond to difference. It's not just agree or I hate you. In fact, we suggested to the young people that there were six at least options that they could think of. You could integrate practices that are unfamiliar to you. You can celebrate them. If neither of those work, you might tolerate certain ways of being that you feel uncomfortable with. In some cases, you might want to separate yourself from practices that you find quite offensive. And in some cases, you might try and actively eliminate those attitudes. But there's a whole range of approaches. But the best of all of them is to investigate, because so often the disagreements are based on ignorance, and we don't understand what's behind what we see that might make us uncomfortable. And a young Catholic boy decided that um, he was going to respond with the word eliminate 
to the practice of the Jewish Sabbath. When I told this young Catholic boy that I switched my phone off on Friday afternoon and I was not available for work for 25 hours, he said this was against his principles and that Jesus had made clear that celebrating this, observing the Sabbath was not as important. I'll tell you later where he got it from. Um, it was not as important as serving your community, that it was selfish of me to switch my phone off and stay at home rather than looking after my disciples. I was taken aback, but I celebrated this young man's attempt at honest dialogue because he wasn't agreeing with me, but he was speaking from his understanding of his scripture, however accurate or inaccurate it was. A third story. I was in New York for my son's engagement celebration. Um, my son, Nachman, recently married a, a maths teacher. And while I was in New York at 2 a.m., I had a Zoom call with leaders in Australia. Um, some bridge builders in Australia had given up since October um, because other people would not condemn in the ways that they wanted them to condemn. And I tried to explain to these leaders that the cost of cohesion cannot be paid in the currency of condemnation. We cannot demand other people to agree with us Dialogue is about listening and hearing the other rather than telling others what to think. I returned to Australia and I must admit there were moments of despair, of concern. Some things that we did before October we're not doing at the moment. But there are other things that we are. I went to a Muslim school and we spoke to students about Jewish marriage, a Muslim scholar, female scholar and myself and then invited the students to ask questions. And they asked, why is it that at Jewish weddings, we break a glass and that takes us back to Jerusalem and the destruction of a temple. And the sky didn't fall in. No angry mob came shouting. There was quiet dialogue. There was a Muslim woman with a kafir, Palestinian woman, a wonderful individual who looked down and felt uncomfortable when we spoke about Jerusalem. Discomfort is part of dialogue, but there's also moments of joy. And one of my Muslim colleagues, Kalisha, was at an Orthodox Jewish school the other week and the children were finishing her sentences. She said, what does every girl want when she goes to school? She just wants to, and all the girls said, fit in. And there was this moment of really getting each other. A few weeks later, Kalisha came back to the school and some of the Jewish children were just so welcoming. Rabbi Yitzchak Arama taught that peace is an essential part of the way that the world works, because all of us, apart from the creator, are composites of different elements that need to collaborate and come together. When these start to fall apart, we disintegrate. And so peace is nothing but integrated diversity. Uh, thank you, Rabbi. Um, you're rightly highlighting that in Australia at the moment, um, our multicultural togetherness is being challenged. And I thank you for your response uh, to a difficult situation, but we must work at togetherness and the importance of dialogue. So thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Ms. Zohra Ali, sitting next to me here. She is a Shia Muslim, and she's been a member of interfaith groups for the last 15 years, and she's also a member of the Sydney Women's Interfaith Network. And she also volunteers with uh, Together for Humanity, and as a Religions for Peace leader in Asia, he's also a member of Religions for Peace. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Des, and thank you to all the other panelists for their um, uh, reflections as well. And um, before I begin, I just, I mean, I was listening to everyone and thinking, 
I, I'm just an ordinary person. Um, I'm I'm not a um, in any way learned or a priest in my faith. Um, but I think that um, I've been put in extraordinary situations, uh, and that um, has given me some insights, I guess, onto um, how to uh, come towards peace. Um, and and I think the the first thing I would say when I was thinking of what I'm going to talk about today, I, I thought about some of the things that have I've been through in my life. And of course, you always ignore the most obvious thing, uh, which for me, I guess, is something that I've dealt with for, for many, many years. And that is being a, um, a woman who stands out because I wear the hijab. Um, I'm very obviously Muslim. And um, that is a point of difference everywhere that I've been in my life. Um, so whether I was at university in England in the 80s, where you know people didn't really see women at university wearing the hijab, um, uh, having to constantly explain who I was, where I was from, because I sort of um, traveled from a, a different part of the world. I was living, I'd grown up in Dubai. I was uh, born in Kenya. I had East African grandparents. So I had this sort of really, I was a mixed bag and I had to constantly explain myself to people. And um, I think that sort of laid a foundation in, in me of uh, being different and learning how to explain that difference to other people and getting, you know, allowing other people to understand the other. Uh, I didn't realize that at that time I was always a very shy and introverted person as a teenager and even a young um, adult. But um, I suppose I was laying foundations for other things that were going to happen in my life. Um, so anyway, fast forward a few years, I got married um, to uh, a man who had who was similar background to me, born in East Africa, but he migrated to Australia in the 70s. And um, my husband came from a very um, a set of parents who had uh, laid foundations for um, you know community uh, Muslim community gatherings uh, in Australia in in Sydney. And he always had this dream that if he ever made it big, you know, if he ever was able to, he would build a mosque. Um, and so I, I didn't know that when I met him um, and got married to him. But um, if you, I'm just going to set the scene for you. It's um, 2002. My husband was able to buy a piece of land in a place called Annan Grove in North Sydney, Northwest Sydney, which was then affectionately known as the Bible Belt of Australia of Sydney. 60% um, people identified as Christians. And um, imagine putting a mosque in the Bible Belt. Um, he bought the land in October, uh, in, in 2002. Um, I think it was around May, June, something like that. And in, in October 2002, the Bali bombings took place. Uh, 88 Australians were killed and Muslims were, you know, uh, at the forefront of um, the picture there, not very popular. Um, and you can imagine, um, the uproar that the local residents had to this proposal in council of building a mosque, putting a mosque in their midst. So we began this battle of, um, you know, how are we going to build a mosque in a place where people don't want us to be? Um, and how do we show everyone that, you know, really, as Muslims, we were just as scared of terrorists as every other person, because we were not uh, terrorists. We were just ordinary people. Um, like um, the song that was shared earlier, we're all we all have the same sorts of um, you know desires and beliefs and wants from our lives. We all want to um, you know uh, do things in our own way, but we are really similar at the um, at, at the at the base of it all. Um, so there was a very lengthy battle, a very lengthy process of um, uh, the the. The local council uh, rejected the proposal. There were about 8,000 letters from residents. And I can tell you that Annan Grove in 2002 did not have 8,000 houses, but there were 8,000 letters. Um, and in a, in a meeting that the local council had, um, one of the first meetings, there were 700 people. Uh, my husband went with a couple of, uh, a, a small group of um, supporters, but there were, there were police, there were, you know, um, uh, it, it was quite a sort of scary situation almost in a sense. Um, and, and from then on, it, it was um, a, a situation where I think you, you often, you, you have to understand that to, um, to create peace, you, you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. 
Uh, and that that is something that I had learned in those early years of mine in London, that um, often to do something uh, which is different, to do something, you know, to create peace for, for what you want, you have to be ready to um, push yourself into a, an, in, out of your comfort zone. So anyway, this, just to continue the story, um, the following year, we, we had to take the, um, the case to uh, the Land and Environment Court. And um, fortunately, we, we won. Um, and we were able to proceed with building the mosque. Um, we, our, our proposal was in line with um, the town planners of Borkham Hills. And building began, it was June 2004. And um, one morning, my husband woke up with to these frantic calls from the builder who was uh, a, a friend called George Al Sabah, who was a Christian, um, an Orthodox Christian. And he said, you, you know, um, Abbas, don't come to the mosque because um, there's pig's heads um, on the, you know, um, at the boundaries and inside the building, there were pigs, more pig's heads blood awful all over the walls, which had just been recently been rendered. Um, and of course, my husband doesn't listen. So he did go. Um, and, you know, to their credit, George and his men who are mainly uh, a, a lot of Christian Lebanese uh, builders in, in George's group um, had taken a lot of pains to clean up the building. The police were there as well helping. Um, and, and, you know, uh, there was for a moment this wondering what's going to happen next. You know, there's been this sort of desecration of the building, but um, Abbas was very quick to, quick to explain that as Muslims we don't consume pork, but touching a pig is is not a is not an issue itself. So the building is going to continue, and the mosque is going to, you know, um, go on. So that was twenty years ago, and we're now very happy residents of Annan Grove. Um, before we began to build, there was a church, a Catholic church, down one end of the road. There was a Zoroastrian um, temple um, about two, three minutes on the other side as well. And we have um, had several interfaith gatherings at our mosque. Uh, we've been part of the community. Um, and um, yeah, I, I would say, uh, as, as Muslims would say, Alhamdulillah, we've come a long way, thanks to God. Um, the gong hasn't gone, so I'm I'm just conscious. <laughs> um, it, it has, it has. Okay, I'll, I'll just, I'll just end. Then I didn't hear it clearly. Um, I, I will just end with saying that um, many times, you know, you're always looking for the threats from outside, as we did in those early days. But um, I just want to leave that um, thought that now that we, um, you, you know, uh, troubles and and lack of peace of always come often comes from out to sources, but it also exists from within. Um, and in, in a community, in any community, there's always little little bubbles of, um, you know, discomfort within as well. So we always have to be mindful of those things. And I think what my other panelists have said earlier in, in terms of um, talking about dialogue, inner listening and outer listening, listening to each other is really important um, in this journey. Peace is not, um, a, you know, it's not a sort of... Um, it's not something that's easily achieved. It's a it's a work in progress. It's a journey. Um, so yeah, and and something that we're constantly on. Thank you. Thank you, Zara. It reminds me of the situation not so long ago in Bendigo, when uh, it was proposed to build a mosque mm -hmm. on the outskirts of Bendigo. I was born in Bendigo. And uh, the in Melbourne, we have the Victoria Police Multi-Faith Council that I sit on. And these right-wingers, and the police knew them well, had turned up and made this big demonstration against a possible building of the mosque. And this was causing a lot of angst. So we, um, because we had the religious contacts in Bendigo, um, we formed a Bendigo Interfaith Council. And so it went ahead, the building of the mosque. It was being built mainly for international students coming to attend La Trobe University. That was what was driving it. So, you know, it worked out okay. Good ending. All right, our last speaker is Reverend Manus Koch, um, who was brought up in a devout Christian family in India. And he now is a Uniting Church minister with a 
passionate belief in interfaith and in social justice and um, many other things. He is also a, a member of the New South Wales um, Faith Affairs Council. I think I've got it right. And I must congratulate New South Wales, bit hard for Melbourne to say that, um, for setting this up. Um, and it's an example to other states, and it's an example to Australia. We at Religions for Peace Australia have begun agitating for setting up a multi-faith council of Australia to deal with um, so many issues that we have. So, Manus. Thank you, Des. Um, but uh, may I have a word with the timekeeper? May I use the one and a half minute that my brother did not use? Thank you. Agreed. Good afternoon, everyone. And first, I would like to thank the Religions for Peace for organizing this very timely event and inviting me to be a member of the panel alongside these distinguished people. Oh, Brahma Kumaris, thank you. Uh, Togetherness, sharing stories of peace building in challenging times. As I reflect on this topic and look at the world right at this moment, it reminds me of an old story. It's a parable of porcupine. During a very cold winter, a group of porcupines wanted to move close to one another to share heat to survive, but they could not as they could not avoid hurting one another with their sharp spines. Though they all shared the intention of a close reciprocal relationship, this could not happen for the reasons they could not avoid. Looking at the happenings of the world, it seems to me that though we don't have sharp quills like the porcupines, but the effects of those happenings overseas are landing on our shores, and the resultant anger, hatred, war of words, maligning of one another, distrust, suspicion, fear, and not pe letting people of different faiths to come together. It will be naive to ignore this reality. However, I believe that in challenging times, it is imperative for people of faith to come together in the spirit of interfaith for building friendship and peace. It's not easy, but it's possible as it has happened in the past. That's not the time bell. No, okay. I will share with you some stories of recent past. First, the COVID-19. I think it was the most challenging time in our history. But it has shown how people of different faith can come together, tackle it, and find strength, courage, comfort, and peace from one another. We have seen it happen in our own city of Sydney. On a personal level, I lost my dear brother who died from COVID in 2021 in India. We are not just brothers, we are partners in crime. I was devastated. I wanted to go to India, but due to border closure, I could not. And it was the most terrible time in my life. But that was the time when love, sympathy, condolences, and prayers were poured upon me by people from many faiths, and I found comfort and peace. During the COVID-19 peak, I was the minister of Lee Memorial Church in Parramatta, where we ran feeding program for the poor and the homeless. In those days, we were inundated with people seeking help as many people lost their jobs and the overseas students could not get back to their home and were finding hard to meet their ends. Again, it's the extraordinary kindness of people from many faiths that helped us help those needy and vulnerable of our communities in those dark days. After the massacre of 7th October, and the ensuing war in Gaza, when there is so much tension, distrust, 
more than 150 Jewish, Christian, and Muslim people gathered at a prayer vigil in a church in the heart of Sydney. They prayed together. They spent time in silence and they comforted each other, offering shalom, salam, and peace. This year, I have been blessed to be invited to various iftas and Passover celebrations. For me, it was heartwarming to see the number of Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, and other faith guests who came to those celebrations. These are true testaments to friendship and community spirit. After the shocking stabbing incidents in Bondi and in Wakely, again, people from different faiths gathered to offer prayers from their respective faiths, expressing their solidarity with the sufferers and offering support and strength to one another. As I spoke with the attendees of these interfaith gatherings, I found that there was a deep collective determination in those people to navigate through the divisive and challenging time with compassion and kindness. And the belief that when we find each other, when we see each other's humanity, we can start healing the wounds and divisions of our communities and the world. This coming together in challenging time, I subscribe to the admonition of the Hebrew sage Hillel. He said, do not separate yourself from the community and do not judge another person until you have been in his place. We cannot end up talking past each other or continue to be defensive or fail to try to see things from others' points of view. People too often recognize human rights violations against their own group and understand when they are the victims, but they fail to recognize when they are the perpetrators of human rights abuse against the other because they may be in a position of power and privilege on another dimension. Recent interfaith events in Sydney continue to give me hope that no matter what is happening in other parts of the world or even in our own country, we cannot afford our interfaith dialogue work to be derailed because despite the challenges, it offers a powerful path towards building bridges and fostering a more inclusive society. Considering these challenges, I would say that's even more important to strengthen our interfaith efforts and continue celebrating the positive impact we can make together through practical action to heal and unite our communities. As a person of faith and one who is passionate about interfaith, my prayer is, God, show us light beyond our own, that even when we feel graceless and weary to the very bone, we may find faith in alien places and know that we are not alone. Thank you very much uh, for reminding us of the of how we must keep working together. A few days ago, August the 29th, I think it was, in Canning Vale in Perth at the Sikh Gurdwara, the Gurbani Gudka Sahib, which is the sacred text that is honoured in every Sikh Gurdwara, was taken, desecrated, torn up, and put into the toilet. There's now a little campaign um, led by the Sikhs to join with them in condemning this desecration. So there are going to be challenges along the way, and um, we must be uh, united in reacting to them. So thank you very much, Manas. Now, for the next 20 minutes, we are. I am going to throw the... 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Oh, okay. Thanks. All right. Um, 
questions, comments uh, from you people gathered here, but also we have about 100 signed up for the online uh, section of, and I can see uh, Terry Sussmilch there in front of me on the screen. Terry is um, a Brahma Kudmari in Hobart, and she's the head of Religions for Peace Tasmania. And she's been instrumental in setting up multicultural, multi faith organizations in um, in Tasmania. So good to see you. So we, I think we have the capacity to take questions uh, from online, um, but I open it to you for comments, questions, whatever. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Brahma Kumaris, for organizing these events. I have been coming quite a few times. Uh, <clears throat> I follow Baha'i Faith. Uh, Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i Faith, said, the well-being of mankind, peace and security are unattainable unless and until Unity is firmly established. This unity cannot be achieved so long as the counsels revealed by the pen of the Most High are suffered to pass unheeded. So the religions have a role to play in bringing peace. Whatever the faith that we follow, we have to teach our younger generation these core values of all the religions, the virtues, so that we can become united. The inherent oneness of humanity must be in our mind all the time. And we have to transcend the differences and harmonize the perspectives and use consultation for making decisions. Thank you very much. Any other comment, please? Yes, please. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, my question and also my point is to make a bridge of the peace among every united human, different countries, especially those ones they are in conflict and war between Jewish, Muslims, and little bit of Christianity. If we cannot make changes among us, or hide you, your religion, your book, and she says, he says, I hate your people, your practice, your religion, your costume, your veil, your... Um, practicing in um, different things like, I don't know how could I put it, the word, like, um, you know, the one they don't wear proper dress, they are not really, you know, clothes, perhaps. If we cannot make that changes among us, there is no way to make a peace. That's all, we have to make a change in our attitude to love each other and through the love, the peace will follow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comments from the panel? Someone online? I think probably many of us are aware of the golden rule um, that exists in every faith whether it's do unto others as you would have done to yourself, um, treat others in the way you wish to be treated, love others as yourself. So this is the golden rule that exists in every single tradition. Thank you.
I have a question to the panel. Uh, I am a Hindu by birth, but my kids follow Sabbath on Saturday. And I go to church when I feel lonely. And I go to Muslim friends to feel the brotherhood on Eid. So it's every religion has something to offer. And like I loved the way BK Maureen has told that if we put faith in our heart and use heart more than our mind, then peace and love is possible. So the question is, how do we create that love among all religions? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that comment. The challenge over here. Put your hand up, please. Oh, question online, okay. Yeah. I'm happy to respond. Uh, I think that um, we are, we want some of the stuff, the research and into prejudice, um, uh, teach us a about the importance of empathy. I think it's it's easier to hate someone whose story you never heard. Um, if you walk uh, in someone's shoes, if you have a bit of a sense of what their experience is, listening to Zora and you know that morning with the the, the mosque filled with pigs' heads, it, it's it's um, an important part of love. Uh, I think all of us, as you said, um, have that golden rule. But I think in some faith communities, um, there's a sense that there is a lot of love for us for people like us and it's story dialogue hearing each other's stories empathy um that helps us understand that the us and in, is is broader and includes other people so i think that can help thank you so just going online now for the question from our onliner please okay a question from online please go ahead Terry? Uh, there's a Go ahead, Terry. On, there's a question online. I am an early childhood teacher. Uh, we are teaching four and five year olds about peace and respect. I am happy for someone to talk about education, educating our young generation about peace. Right. I think that's your question. <laughs> Uh, I, I think um, particularly for early childhood, it's really important for early childhood teachers to, to develop themselves as leaders, um, as as role models. Um, so I, 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 uh, in the work that we've done, we've done a lot of work with um, helping teachers develop their intercultural understanding and their own um, curiosity and capacity for dialogue. Um, so I, I know about that. I don't know specifically how um, one helps four and five year olds to, to uh, put themselves into someone else's shoes. Um, but I think uh, one, one thing you can do as an early childhood teacher is educating yourself and encouraging your colleagues to educate themselves. And that'll flow on to your students, I believe. Yeah, I think there's another dimension here. And that is uh, about religious schools and to what extent the study of other world faiths is part of the religious education curriculum, whether it's a Catholic school or an Anglican school, a Jewish school, a Muslim school. Um, it's very, very important. And I am worried that in our government schools in Victoria, there is no religious education at all. Special religious um, classes were cut out about 10 years ago, and I think that's very unfortunate. Just to continue on this, um, last year I spoke at the um, Islamic State University in Jakarta to the um, postgraduate uh, students. And for some reason, they asked me to, to speak on religious schools in Australia. 
And they were stunned when I told them that in Australia there are 49 Muslim schools funded by state and federal governments. They couldn't believe it. But that's part of our commitment to a multicultural, multi-faith Australia. So very important. Okay, thank you for the question. And now we have another question online. If Philippa could come online, please, and ask your question. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you very much. It's been wonderful to join this dialogue. I've been heartened to hear some of the examples from the speakers about how friendships between faiths have given comfort in difficult times. And I'm wondering if perhaps Religions for Peace could maybe collect examples of the methods by which these strong friendships are built up over time, whether that's by hosting interfaith prayers or by forging friendships in other ways. I'd just be interested in looking at the range of the types of combined activities that give us these deep friendships, because I think it's the deep friendships of knowing each other as humans that are resilient when the world has been having these repeated shocks of awful events happening between faiths. Thank, Thank you, you Philippa. I should explain that Philippa is the chair of Religions for Peace Australia. Um, and I think she generally lives in uh, Adelaide, so I think that's probably where she is now, but I wouldn't be sure. Okay, yes, thank you for that, Philippa. And one last question from this brother over here. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to know if the speakers could elaborate more on the concept of dialogue, uh, particularly given how that seems to be a very challenging thing to do in today's society. And it's where we seem to be really struggling is even to how to have conversations that build trust and build bridges rather than drive us apart. And I think increasingly more and more people are scared to enter into conversations because of that fear that the conversation might actually be a cause of more harm to the relationship than good. And um, so I was wondering, in particularly drawing on the very rich traditions of faith and spirituality that are here, if maybe we could just elaborate or if some would like to elaborate more on what are some of the principles and characteristics of such a dialogue that we've carried with us for generations that maybe we can bring back into these, um, this concept of dialogue that we're trying to, I guess, bring to the fore right now. And I'd love to hear, you know, everyone is coming from such rich traditions and, and love to hear more of the the specifics or the principles or the values that guide what, what it is that, that allows that dialogue to be effective. In 1777, we had one religion in this country that we aspired to, but we don't call it religion because as one of my old elders told us a long time ago, religion is for those who believe in hell. Spirituality is for those who have been there. <clears throat> and for us, we now have to confront as an Indigenous peoples, the first peoples of this land for the first time in our history, not just the colonisation process, not just because of how our dispossession of land and culture and children and all kinds of other uh, issues that we're facing, but also you religions. And we don't have a relationship with you, very little relationship with you. And we don't know how or when or where or how, you know, the, the, the whole process of you religions actually coming to shake our hands and saying, how can we help? I mean, right now I'm going through the desperation in our community because we've We've had two suicides in, in one week. And so we're dealing with that. Then we're dealing with deaths in custody. Then we're dealing with children who were taken from their, their families and put into foster homes. Then we're dealing with the government who's putting our 10-year-old children into jail. And so we're frustrated by the whole process. And I like these conversations, but I want to see some action too. 
I want to see some kind of deliberations as to how we can help our younger generation come to grips with these issues and uh, work forward to, to, to a better future for this country here. We don't have a vision anymore. We don't have a vision for this country. And perhaps something that uh, this this particular gathering should look at and think about. Um, I'm not a part of these uh, religious discussions myself, although I'd love to be, uh, but it would be good to find out what all the religions in this country of mine have in store for themselves as well as for our nation. Um, yeah, okay. Yes. Oh. Sorry, I just wanted to add. Um I've I've been um a part of interfaith groups and um in, in my experience uh with dialogue, one of the important things is to create a safe space where everyone feels that they can share um from their faith. Uh and the other thing that's really important, and I think that's something that I find uh is is really um key is is to be curious about the other person so when when someone you know in our interfaith meetings when someone explains um and many of members of my interfaith groups are here today we we often pick a topic for the year and then each faith talks about that particular topic from their faith perspective and um in in these meetings uh everyone listens from a you know um point of curiosity just to get to know the other so we're not going we're not there to convert each other or we're not there to argue who's right and who's wrong we're just there to to sort of understand why we do dif the things the way we do and I think those two things um having that safe space and curiosity real just curiosity about the other are very important in dialogue from my experience thank you but thank you Maureen thank you just uh, just briefly, dialogue does take a lot of courage, a lot of patience, and you mustn't give up. If it doesn't work immediately, keep trying. Um, but also just thinking about young people, um, it's often very effective to get to have young people of different faiths come into an activity together first. And I remember when we'd hosted I don't know if the Duke of Edinburgh Award is known here because it's, it is. Yeah. Okay. So he had hosted a gold award and it was actually the first time they had something interreligious or interfaith uh, or young people from different faiths and our retreat centers near the River Thames. So first um, the people facilitating took them canoeing, took them doing different act field activities, which they thoroughly enjoyed. And then after a couple of days, they felt so comfortable with each other that they were happy to talk about their faith, to exchange, and to really get to know each other. So that was a very good way, and especially for young people. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yes, quick. Uh, just very quickly, uh, to Philippa's point, uh, um, we're very happy um, to support Religions for Peace, to gather um, examples, and certainly in Adelaide, there's the Abraham Institute that's doing great work as well. Um, to your point about about um, dialogue, you absolutely agree. Um, to have effective dialogue, it helps particularly for young people to laugh together, to do things together, so you, you have that rapport. Um, but also one thing that a young a Catholic girl said to us on Friday, um, that was that I think is really important. They've done a whole term on interfaith dialogue, and she was surprised when she heard that it's okay uh, in dialogue to insist that you have the truth. Um, dialogue does not mean relativism. It doesn't mean um, that everyone has to pretend to agree. Um, as Zora said, there needs to be a willingness to to sit with some discomfort and to hear things that uh, you think are simply untrue. But uh, to to another person is absolutely the truth, and and that it's it's got to be broader than just people that are very uh, you know sort of postmodern or or very relativist because that's ex excluding a certain part of the, um, the religious communities. All right, thank you very much. I my response is certainly our philosophy of religions for peace is dialogue through action. Okay, it's when we're working together. Yes, we've got to talk, talk, 
but as a prelude to actual action. And for example, our Asian women's group is involved in um, human trafficking of women and children being opposed to that and training people. So, you know, there are a whole lot of initiatives that can be done. All right, we're now going to break up into groups, um, including online. Um, so I'll let that happen. But if we just go into groups of about eight to ten, four, four, four groups. Oh, okay, all right. Four groups of ten. Gr groups of four. Or... Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, yes, and you'll just have ten minutes to get one or two central ideas that you'd like to share with the group here uh, when we've finished the ten minutes. So. At about twenty to five, twenty to five, six, um, we'll then come back. Okay, so please get into your small groups and take it from there. Okay, also online. So the question... So the questions for your small groups are on the sheets of paper that you've been given, but they're also on the whiteboard at the back. What are what have we learned from our stories? And a second question to consider is, what are the qualities and skills which make peacemaking efforts successful? And for those online, you'll find it in the chat box. They're going to feed back.
Can you get one central idea from your group? Yes. Yes. Yeah, all right. Well, mm. groups. I expect you will have to Thank you. 
Yeah, see, they're asking. Right. Thank you. No, I've, I've got a mind. Wrap up your conversations and um, know that you can continue them in the dining room when we close, but it's now time to draw you all back into the main group. All right. I want, I want to get some feedback from the groups. Um, there's too many groups for us to get feedback from every group. But if there's a really new idea or something in your group that you would like to share with uh, the whole group, then please put up your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Who wants to speak for their particular group? Yes? Here we are, over here. So in our group, uh, the new topics we discussed, apart from the ones which were brought up in the panel discussion, that was our tolerance, acceptance, and deep listening. OK, thank you. Another group want to share their thinking with the whole group. Here we are, over hello. here. Oh, hello, just ask quickly. Thank okay. you. Okay. Hi, we just wanted to build on um, the diversity in voices, and we talked a little bit about um, the, you know, children in the younger generation, you know, instilling that sense of empathy. Um, you know, we talked about schools being a really interesting um, and important place, not just teaching one religion, but all religions, so that we can start empathy and kindness, and that can come up the ranks. And then we talked a little bit about, you know, economics and world orders and how big that is. And gosh, like, how can we even hope to influence that level but what can we do as individuals sitting in this room um and we talked a lot about just loving thy neighbor okay. um and and starting there as as the you know a foundation for peace all right thank you over here and while the mic's going here here's one from online pride and ego can get in the way of peace building we need to learn humility and compassion and forgiveness. Learn to put ourselves in another's shoes will require open dialogue and safe spaces. Thus, the key is how to secret safe spaces and how do we help provide meditation, mediation, create spaces that are open and demonstrably safe. Reciprocity is important. Okay. Yeah, in our group, the consensus on the first question was uh, with regard to the point of trust, and trust heals, trust builds, and trust takes time, and also the opposite, that you can't easily trust, don't trust, too. Uh, and uh, in, in answer to the second, how do we develop the skill set uh, of uh, persisting and uh, going back to being uh, following the golden rule and uh, being patient and persisting in getting to know the other through deep listening, that could be very helpful. Yeah. All right, if there's one more, I'll take that. Okay, here in the front.
Thank you. Oh, you're going to hold it. <laughs> I can hold it. Oh, hello, everyone. My name's Victoria, and I didn't know I'd be speaking here today. Can I hold it? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is that all right? Yes. Uh, look, look, what I've got from today with the four of us speaking, the bottom line is we've all come together here today. And apart from the questions, it's how all of this, this community here is making us feel as a group. I've had, I'm listening to a Muslim person, um, Brahma Kamari, I'm listening to um, Jewish people, and it, it makes me a little more aware. I'm not usually put in this situation. So, and I think for all of us, it's wonderful to be here together. And and these four pe us four people have got such a different opinion, but we all came together. And I will leave here today with much more awareness of what this group has done today. So thank you very much. I think the questions were great and thank you. Thank you for letting me hold them. All right, thank you very much uh, for this celebration of togetherness. Um, it's been wonderful that we've been able to come together from around Australia through the wonderful online service. I've been asked to give a short summary. I think that would be impossible for me. Um, because I want to focus in my closing remarks on a situation that has emerged. And that is what Reverend Ray was talking about, his own community, Aboriginal spiritualities. Two years ago, the University of Divinity which is mainly in Melbourne, but it is in other parts of Australia in its different uh, constituent colleges, formed wonderfully a school of Indigenous studies. They had a wonderful conference in early February. A month ago, the University of Divinity axed the School of Indigenous Studies, allegedly on the basis of not enough funds were raised. Oh. All right. That conference was led by Professor Anne Patel Gray, um, who also comes from Queensland, uh, lives in Brisbane. And I want to quote to you, and this is, these are my final remarks that we all have to take on board, not just the Christians. The final word of the conference came from Professor Patel Gray. She strongly stated that she wants to see the churches driving the agenda for a treaty and we have to hold the churches accountable. We are all called to be prophetic. It is your sin, the sin of white Christians, that we Indigenous peoples carry. We are so beaten by oppression. We have buried too ma many of our peoples before their time. You are locking up our children. Do not be silent anymore. The media won't listen to us, but they may listen to you. Use God's power to bring a treaty to act justly. We want to be able to flourish and thrive. You have too many assets and too much land. Let us be open to God in this conversation. Let it be the beginning of our future. We do not want to remain in the margins. Open the doors and let us in. And we are still hurting from the referendum. Thank you.
All right, to finish off, um, we have some closing prayers and Sister Maureen is going to lead us in the meditation. Thank you. Thank you for this very, very rich afternoon, rich and I think sustaining and affirming for all of us in the work that we're engaged in. I'd like to spend a few minutes, <laughs> I'd like to spend a few minutes in reflection. Take a few moments to listen. To listen to the sound of humanity, the needs of our brothers and sisters, to take a moment to listen to my own heart and conscience. and to listen to the divine inspiration. In listening, we learn, we grow. And in true listening, we go deeper into the understanding of our own selves, of our inner spirituality, of our inner being. And in that inner journey, I discover that my original nature is peace. This is something that I share with every single human being. Our original nature is peace. And in that state of peace, listening to the call of the divine. I connect with the greater peace, the source of peace. And I'm filled with the strength of peace and the healing power of divine love. <laughs> As this fills my being, I naturally share the deep and profound vibrations of unlimited peace, unlimited love, reach out to those around me, and further to our world. Creating the atmosphere where others can awaken the call of their hearts and experience in a peace 
and love. It is the natural nature of all of us. Reaching out in this way, we come together and together we create a world of peace, a world of love, where every human being is valued, where the sanctity of self held, and where we always work for the greater good of the whole of humanity. Thank you, Om Shanti, I am peace. The closing prayer will be said by the Vedanta Hindu nuns. Om Shanti Prithivi Shanti Shanti Oshadhaya Shanti Vanaspataya Shanti Vishwedeva Shanti Brahma Shanti Sarvam Shanti Shanti Reva Shanti Om Shanti 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 Om May there be peace in heaven. May there be peace in the sky. May there be peace on earth. May there be peace in water. May there be peace in the plants. May there be peace in the trees. May there be peace in gods. May there be peace in Brahman. May there be peace in all. May that peace, real peace, be mine. Om Sarvastarutu Durgani Sarvo Bhadrani Pashyatu Sarvasadbuddhi Mapnotu Sarvasarvatranandatu May all be free from dangers. May all realize what is good. May all be actuated by noble thoughts. May all rejoice everywhere. Om Sarve Bhavandu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyandu Ma Kaschit Dukkha Bhag Bhavet May all be happy. May all be free from disease. May all realize what is good. May none be subject to misery. <coughs> Om Durjana Sajjano Bhuyat Sajjana Shanti Mapnuyat Shanto Mucheta Bandhe Bhyo Mukta Shanyan Vimo Chayet May the wicked become virtuous. May the 
virtuous attain tranquility. May the tranquil be free from all bondages. May the freed make others free. Loka samasta sukhino bhavandu. Loka samasta sukhino bhavandu. Loka samasta sukhino bhavandu. May the world be prosperous and happy. Om Shanti 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 Om Peace 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 All right, thank you very much for attending today and celebrating together togetherness. I want to thank um, firstly Tim for your contribution today to the five panelists. Thank you very much. To all the technical staff in the background there, but I particularly want to thank Gabriel who's done all the organization and um, that's not easy. And also to thank Dr. Sue Ennis there, um, who is the Secretary of Religions for Peace Australia. Um, she's uh, been a student of mine, unfortunately. <laughs> I supervised her PhD which was on religion, spirituality, and the refugee experience. And it was has been published as a book. So thank you, Gabriel, and to Sue. So, and Robert. And Robert. Robert yes. So much quietly. Okay. All right. Good on you, Robert. Robert's the head of Religions for Peace New South Wales, if you don't know him. He hangs out at the Vedanta Society building at in Croydon. Yes, yes. Okay. So I think there's uh, dinner is in the kitchen somewhere in the. All right. You, you... And a thank you to you for oh. sharing so beautifully. Thank you. It's been my honor and privilege. and. In my role as moderator of Religions for Peace Asia, was 22 member nations, and um, led by China and India. So those 22 member nations encompass 52% of humanity. And in a few weeks' time, I will be in Beijing speaking, not quite sure yet. They haven't told me what to speak on, but anyway. Um, and that, so I was there last year, 12 months ago. And um, I don't believe what you hear about, about religion in China. It's much more complex than um, what we're being told. And I could give a lecture on that almost, but I won't. You've had enough of me already. Um, so... Um, we're involved in all sorts of work, so I commend Religions for Peace Australia to you and Asia as well. Okay, thank you.